Okay, we're recording. Uh, welcome everybody. This is the bi-weekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. Um, today, we have Kirlios El Saad speaking um, on formal analysis of the SBP protocol, session binding proxy protocol. Um, he's been doing this work for his master's thesis and as part of the activities of the UMBC Protocol Analysis Lab. Um, tomorrow, uh, CDL Cyber Defense Lab is uh, resuming its biannual tradition of doing a hike in April and October, and uh, we're going to be hiking uh, Loudon Heights in Harpers Ferry. Um, anybody who's interested can uh, contact me for details. Uh, we're kicking off at 10 o'clock. So uh, it's our pleasure to have uh, Kirlios. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. Let me see if I can. All right, let me know once uh, you can see my presentation. I can see. Okay, sweet. So um, thank you for, for coming to my talk. Uh, the title of the talk is a formal methods analysis of the a session binding proxy protocol uh, in the analysis was done using the cryptographic protocol shapes analyzer. All of that will make will mean mo much more to you by the end of the talk, I promise. Uh, but uh, I want to start off by giving an overview of what I'll be talking about. So, okay. So we analyzed the session binding proxy protocol. Um, it attempts to prevent session hijacking and it does this, it, it relies on the uh, underlying encrypted uh, SSL TLS channel. And through the course of our analysis, we found a, uh, encrypt a cryptographic flaw in this channel, which if, if it's exploited, it can render um, the security of HTTP and HTTPS um, pretty much equivalent. So uh, we'll talk about what that flaw is. Uh, we'll talk about how it can be exploited, uh, what the ramifications of, uh, of that discovery is, um, and all of that, which none of that is true. I, I don't want to live in a world where encryption over the internet is not possible. Hopefully I got one or two of you with that. Um, what I'll actually be talking about is the, so I, we did analyze the session binding proxy protocol. It does attempt to prevent session hijacking, but what we found is that it relies critically on the underlying encrypted communications channel, which uh, we know can be undermined using one known attacks. And um, even with SPP implemented, it's still possible for a partial session hijacking uh, via a tailgate attack. And I'll talk more about that, but basically a tailgate attack is when the adversary injects code into the client's browser and that code runs to forge and send a valid state changing request to the server, which the server will, um, will honor. So uh, let's, let me... Okay, so we'll start by giving you um, an outline of what I'll be talking about. So I'll go into why we picked this protocol and then give you a little bit of background about, you know, a quick refresher of what session hijacking is, um, how session binding proxy works, how it combats session hijacking, um, and then we'll go over the related previous work. And then we'll go into the methods uh, and tools. So I'll talk about our adversarial model that we uh, tested SVP against. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the tool, CPSA, Cryptographic Protocol Shapes Analyzer, um, our model inside this tool. And then I'll present four different scenarios that we ran and we'll analyze them together. And then um, we'll present recommendations for mitigating the, um, uh, the attacks we found. Uh, we'll go into discussion, conclusion, and then hopefully there'll be some time for questions at the end. So I'll start with uh, motivation. So um, in the protocol analysis lab, uh, we are exploring the importance of cryptographic binding. Um, Ennis, who is a member of the lab, his PhD dissertation is about the importance of cryptographic binding. And he's the one who came across this uh, session binding proxy protocol, um, which you know, I'll show you later how we use this cryptographic binding, but we basically wanted to analyze it to see if the binding was uh, soundly implemented and just see, to see if we could find any other structural uh, flaws or design flaws with the protocol. So. Here's the problem that the session binding proxy protocol attempts to solve. It is session hijacking. So a quick overview, a session is just a set of interactions or communications between two or more parties where state is maintained. Um, the easiest way to walk 
you through this is to think about uh, authenticated sessions. So the, a session where you need to log in. Um, usually how that works is you pres the client presents their credentials to the server. If the credential credentials check out, the server returns a token and uh, the client can just attach that token to future requests uh, and the server will honor them because it will use that token to look at the session, find out that the client already authenticated and uh, everything is good. So it honors that session. So session hijacking is when the attacker is able to get a hold of that token and then bind it or attach it to its own requests and send sends those requests to the web server. And um, the web server can't tell the difference. It just knows that it's going to accept that token. So it honors the request that the attacker sends uh, just the same as it would uh, the request that a victim would send. And so why would you hijack it? Well, if you don't have the credentials to establish the session, the next best thing is to hijack and establish the session. So th that's the whole motivation behind that. Um, and there are a bunch of ways to do this. The two that I'm going to talk about because they're relevant to this talk are cross-site scripting and malicious plugins. So um, this bit of code, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this bit of code right here um, is an example of cross-site scripting. Basically, the uh, adversary, the attacker, at, uh, uploads some kind of malicious code to the server, and then the server uh, delivers that code to the client. When it gets to the client's machine and runs inside their browser, uh, it set it manages to leak out the the session token, which in this uh, snippet is the document cookie because the session token is stored as cookies um, in, in the web pages. And once the, the attacker gets a hold of that, they can, you know, send their own requests and just attach that cookie. Uh, and then the other way you could do that is via malicious plugins because malicious plugins also have access to the cookies um, and they can see and read any web pages that go through the browser. So it's, you know, you can see how a malicious plugin will also be able to leak um, the session token to the uh, adversary. So this is the problem that the session binding proxy protocol attempts to solve. So it was proposed in 2013 by Bergers, Verdolt, and uh, Eklund. And um, they, they proposed it because they found uh, session hijacking vulnerabilities in their Blackboard Learn system. And so the, the whole idea behind uh, this protocol is what if presenting the token isn't enough? What if you need to present the token on the right channel that the token was issued on? Um, on the request. And so, so that's basically it. The, the goal is to bind the session token to the secure channel that the token was issued on. Um, and there are three main stages. Uh, the first one is to establish a secure channel, a secure SSL TLS channel. Um, and then once that's established, establish a session. Usually that's done when the client presents uh, credentials over the channel. And if everything checks out credentials wise, uh, the server issues a token and binds it to that channel. Um, and I'll go through that binding process in a minute. And then um, once the client gets that token and gets that yeah, cookie, they can attach it to future requests uh, and send it on the right channel. And then that request will be uh, honored. So that's a high level overview of the protocol. I'm gonna go a little bit in depth. So the, the figure you see on the left is from the paper where, um, where the session binding proxy protocol is proposed. Um, you can see it's broken down into the three stages I talked about, SSL, TLS negotiations, establishing the session, and then using that session to handle requests. Uh, so before I can even go through this, we, we have to assume that the client reaches out over HTTPS, um, and if they don't, then the, the proxy will have to route them to, to the HTTPS port to start this uh, as TLS handshake. Um, and so they, they've abstracted this portion of the protocol to five steps. Uh, the first is the client sends a challenge nonce to the proxy. The proxy responds with an ID nonce and a certificate. And then they don't show this here, but the client is supposed to uh, authenticate that certificate, make sure it's valid. And if so, it should extract the public key from, uh, for the proxy and use it to encrypt a secret nonce, which it sends to the proxy. And then at this point, both um, the client and the proxy have access to both uh, all three of the secret challenge nonces and um, ID nonce. And you hash them together and you get the shared key, which we're going to call K. Um, and then the last two steps is basically each party proving to the other party that it successfully generated the key. Um, 
This is done on the client side by taking the ID that it received, encrypting it with K, send it, sending it back to the proxy. Proxy does something similar, it takes the challenge nonce, encrypts it with K, sends it to the client, and once they each verify that everything checks out, then we have a secure end-to-end uh, -end encrypted channel between the client and the proxy. Uh, so the next part is establishing the session. Um, you, so in, we're going to look at this through the lens of a, an authenticated session. So we're going to assume that the request here has credentials embedded in it. Um, this proxy's main role is to bind cookies to channels. So this request doesn't have a cookie, so it just gets forwarded through to the server. A uh, server is supposed to authenticate the credentials if everything checks out. It generates a cookie, associates it with that client, stores it and then attaches it to the answer or to the response, uh, which it forwards to the proxy, and the proxy is supposed to forward that to the client. Uh, but on the way back, because this uh, response has a cookie, um, the proxy uh, is supposed to bind this cookie to the channel. And so the binding process is really this bit right here. I'm going to go through um, all the different um, variables, and then I'll put it all together. So K is the same shared key we talked about up here. Uh, capital K sub P is the system secret key, I think. Ooh. Something about the formatting got messed up. But um, is the system secret key. Um, and this uh, is constant for all the clients, and uh, only the proxy knows this system secret key. And so you can concatenate them together, you hash that, and then you get a client-specific key, uh, K sub C. And it's client-specific because what went into it is this K, which will be specific to each client. Um, and then once you get that client specific key, you use it to um, encrypt the cookie. And this encryption is done using uh, e AES-256 uh, CBC encryption with a fresh initialization vector for every encryption. Um, and then once it does the encryption, it prepends the uh, initialization vector to the ciphertext that we get out. And that together, those two together is what I'm gonna refer to as the encrypted cookie from now on. So just a high level overview, um, Proxy gets a response with a cookie, swaps out the cookie with the encrypted cookie, and then forwards it to the client. And then once the client gets this encrypted cookie, um, this, the session is established. So now it can at attach that encrypted cookie to any request. Uh, it forwards it to the proxy. The proxy uh, decrypts the cookie um, and then sends it to the server. Um, and if it's a, if the cookie corresponds to an active session, um, the server will um, will see that the client authenticated already and then honor the request. Um, and, and so this is, this is really the important part because if, if the adversary managed to somehow get a hold of the um, encrypted cookie that the client has, if they try to use it, they'll have to set up their own encrypted channel with the proxy. And uh, eventually, you know, they'll end up with a client-specific key that is different from the client-specific key that, the, uh, that was used to encrypt the cookie in the first place. So it'll get decrypted to something that is random. Um, and then when that randomness goes to the server, uh, it will not you know, the server will try to look up a, a session, won't see, we'll see that there is no active session associated with that random cookie. And so it will just redirect the uh, attacker to the login page to authenticate. So that that is how um, the session binding proxy protocol prevents session hijacking. Um, we're gonna go into the analysis, but before that, I wanted to go through the work is out there. Um, to our knowledge, our work is the first formal methods analysis of SPP. Um, but the only we could, I could find one only other uh, security analysis, and it was an informal analysis uh, by the originators of SVP. Uh, they don't draw on any formally defined adversarial models like Dol of Yao, um, which I'll talk about, uh, which is what we use. Um, but instead, they have these six different. Um, sorry, give me one sec. We have these six different levels. Uh, which, you know, as uh, we go up the levels, the adversary has more and more access to the client proxy slash um, server machines. So I won't go too much in depth. I'll just give a quick overview of um, of their levels. Uh, in the first two, the one that I really want to touch on is the cross-site scripting attack. Um, so they say uh, if the adversary is able to leak the cookie, to themselves somehow, uh, that cookie is useless to them because they would have to decrypt it to get the original cookie and then re-encrypt it uh, with their own client-specific key um, before sending it to the proxy. And 
the, the adversary will not have access to either of those keys, the one to decrypt and the one to re-encrypt. So the cookie, the encrypted cookie is useless to them. Uh, we're going to show later that that is not true, that you can still have a partial session hijacking just with that uh, adversarial capability alone of being able to execute uh, a code inside the client's browser. So that is, those are the first two levels. And then as we um, go up the levels, the, the capabilities of the adversary grow. And uh, we'll see that the, um, or the the researchers had to make more informal assumptions to keep SPP intact. So in the following threat model, so threat model three, uh, we assume that the adversary has the same access as a plugin on the client's browser. And this plugin can leak the token, yes, but it can also record credentials. Um, and so, in order for, for, you know, to prevent, you know, complete account takeover. So why would the adversary even bother with the session if it can just steal the credentials and take over the account? So in order to, to keep, keep it intact, we have to assume that um, there is some other factor of authentication at work so that just by seeing the credentials, it's not enough for the adversary to hijack the session so that a client can still form a session, a secure session with the, um, uh, with the proxy and the server. Um, and also they make the assumption that, you know, a plugin can see all the cookies and it can forge requests and send them on the right, uh, on the correct uh, SSL TLS channels. And so in order to, in order for SPP to hold, we kind of have to deem those kinds of attacks, which are called man in the browser attacks. We have to deem them out of the scope of, of the analysis. And if you do that, then SPP holds. Um, in, in level three and level four is very similar. Level four is basically, uh, we're assuming the, uh, uh, adversary has user level access to the computer, so they can just look at the browser and all the browser files, and they can like directly access the cookie that way. Um, and if you make the same assumptions we made um, in level three, SVP should still hold. Uh, or, or th that's what they assert. And then in the last two levels, um, the adversary the adversary has near root level access, or basically has root level access uh, to the client server slash proxy machines and um, they they admit that even at, at, with that level of compromise, that the adversary will uh, the, the SPP will not prevent session hijacking. So I mentioned briefly that you know so these are their six um, uh, adversarial models, and I mentioned briefly that we use the um, Dollar Yao model. So let me walk you through that. So our model is the Dollar Yao network intruder, uh, which we assume has complete control of the network. So it's a pretty powerful adversary. It can read and modify plain text messages. It can encrypt and decrypt messages, but only if it has access to the keys. Whether it was supposed to have access to the keys or whether it can ascertain the keys, uh, it doesn't matter, but it can't break uh, standard crypto. It has to have the keys to uh, encrypt and decrypt. Uh, it can inject, drop, and replay messages. It is able to participate in protocols as a legitimate participant. So it can be, pretend to be a client and reach out to a proxy, or it can, be, it can pretend to be the server and reach out to a client. Um, it can spawn additional instances of legitimate participants. So if we uh, try to just simulate how one client would reach out to one server, it can spawn additional clients and see if it can find some kind of interaction attack between you know the different instances instances of the protocol. Um, so it, it has that capability of spawning additional participants. And we assume it can originate all values, all private keys, all uh, public keys, any value that uh, a participant in the protocol might have to originate. Uh, unless we explicitly state otherwise. And so that is how we will limit uh, some of the capabilities of the dollar of adversary. So this adversary is what is used in CPSA. So CPSA is the Cryptographic Protocol Shapes Analyzer. It is an open source tool um, that is used to analyze network uh, cryptographic protocols. And so in order to use the tool, So in order to use the tool, um, the user would have to define the uh, protocol, which is done in terms of roles. So basically a role is the steps that each participant in the protocol must complete to, to play that role. Um, and then once you've defined the different roles, you basically def define the protocol. Uh, so the next thing you do is you give CPSA initial conditions, which we call skeletons. And in these initial conditions, you specify um, who are the initial participants and what ass origination assumptions uh, are we forcing on uh, the variables that are being uh, that will come and play with the protocol? So origination assumptions let us denote um, certain variables as secret keys so that the adversary can't uh, 
originate them. And we can denote other variables as nonces, meaning for every instance of this protocol, this certain value will be freshly generated. Um, so with these assumptions and the list of initial participants, we give that to CPSA. CPSA inserts the dollar beyond network intruder, and then it searches through all the executions for uh, minimal for minimal executions where um, the initial participants can complete all the steps associated with the role. So if we have a client and a proxy, uh, it tries to see all the different ways it can get the client to step through its roles and the proxy step to step through its roles, uh, not necessarily by direct communication uh, with each other. It will see if there's any other way for that interaction to happen uh, besides you know, the, the, the expected path of execution. So with that, I want to go through um, our model of SVP, the, our CPSA model of SVP uh, that we used for our analysis. So you will see it's a little bit different than their model, and I'm going to walk you through the differences between those. Um, so the left is the figure you saw before, the right is our model. You can see uh, the main difference you can see is that um, they have three roles here. Uh, client proxy, proxy server, we just have client proxy. Uh, we Because this proxy is a server-side proxy, um, we it's not unreasonable to assume that the communications between the proxy and the server will be over a secure channel if they're not already running on the same machine. So with that, we combine those two roles into one, which we call the proxy. And that's really the main difference. There's other minor differences like um, here, the proxy sends the certificate. We just send the public key of the proxy and then using a built-in, you know, something built into CPSA, the client will be able to verify that's actually the public key that belong, belongs to the proxy. Um, and you can see these five are the uh, first stage establishing the channel. These two are the um, establishing the session. Um, and you can see here, they have a request here. We uh, assume that there are some credentials embedded in that request. And um, it, it was tricky to, to get CPSA to denote something as secret, but still allow us to send it over the network because you can denote something as secret, such as a private key. But once you do that, CPSA won't let you send it over the network. And so we had to find a way to say, hey, the adversary can't guess the credentials, but we want to let uh, the client send the credentials over the network if they so choose. And so th this whole, that whole thing is, is just trying to get that property. Um, so the credentials we assume are privileged, in, privileged information. Um, the proxy can authenticate that. And then we also assume that the, the request returns some kind of privileged information. Uh, that's something the adversary shouldn't be able to originate, but the uh, uh, proxy of the client should be able to have access to. Uh, and then the proxy can send it over the network if they so choose. Um, and so with that, I just want to show you, so this is just a graphical representation of our model. This is the actual code that went in. I won't go into the code. I just want to show you that, you know, earlier I mentioned we defined the protocol in terms of roles. So that is what you see here. We see a client role up here, a proxy role up here. Uh, each has a set of steps, send and receive events. And then we uh, add some assumptions if we choose to, uh, to the roles themselves of saying like, hey, the challenge nonce is always going to be a nonce. The secret is always going to be a nonce. For the proxy, it's the same thing. Hey, the ID that you send uh, to the client is always going to be a nonce, and the system secret key is non-originating, meaning uh, it, it is a secret. So no one else but the proxy should be able to originate uh, that key. Um, and then so once you've defined the role, you give it uh, initial conditions, which we call skeletons. And this is an example of a skeleton. Uh, the initial participants in this one are the client and the proxy. And then we here we list uh, other assumptions uh, about the variables that will be used in the, in the protocol. And so once we had a general model of the protocol, we ran four different uh, variations of it. And so I will go through the four different uh, scenarios, and I'll show you what CPSA uh, spat out and then go through and analyze the outputs of uh, CPSA. So the first um, scenario is the happy path. Basically, if we gave the model to CPSA, just as I described it to you, um, and we asked CPSA to look for uh, all the possible execution path, it returns one shape, which is what we call um, this right here, which is just a graphical representation of an execution path. And so this is the happy path shape. You can see that, you know, here are the nine events associated with the client, same as the nine events here. 
uh, nine events with the proxy. Uh, it's a straightforward back and forth between them. Uh, the black dots represent send events. So the client is sending a, a challenge nonce here. Um, a blue uh, indicates uh, a receive event. So this is just the proxy receiving that challenge nonce. And so, th so this is basically what we expect to see. This is the ex expected path of exe uh, execution. But in order to get this uh, expected path, we had to make very strict assumptions on our model, which some of those assumptions might not be reasonable. So the first one we're going to look at is um, that the we're assuming that the client will somehow be able to tell if the public key it receives is a valid public key and th that it belongs to their proxy or not. And that's not always the case. So there are ways to bypass the certificate check. The most obvious way and the one that I can easily uh, show is uh, if the client themselves chooses to bypass that check. So the left is Chrome, the right is uh, Safari. Um, if you try to access a website with, in this case, it was a self-signed certificate, you'll get this message. And um, you can easily bypass this in Chrome. You just literally Google this error along with Chrome bypass, and it's in the first search result. Um, and if you're curious, you just type, this is unsafe, and it takes you to the other side. And then for Safari, it just three clicks away. You click show details, visit website, and it gives you a pop-up. You click visit website, and you're through to the other side. So the client can themselves be tricked into bypassing that uh, certificate check. Uh, another way is the adversary could find a way to get a malicious root certificate authority, or CA, into the client's browser. Uh, that could be either when the uh, client tries to download the browser for the first time, it comes with a malicious root CA embedded in it, or if the adversary tries to embed that CA after the fact. Um, and then there've always, I've seen stories on uh, news of certificate authorities uh, issuing fraudulent um, certificates, not following procedures, in, which has resulted in the issuance of fraudulent certificates. So it's not unreasonable to, to think that a adversary um, would be able to get their hand on a legitimate certificate uh, that will check out in the client's browser, even though they should not have that certificate. Um, and so we wanted to model this in CPSA. And the way we did this is by relaxing the, um, the public key that the client is willing to accept. So before this used to say public key, just like the proxy here, the proxy sending their public key. Um, and we just said the client will accept any key and will make no origination assumptions about the complementary private key. So we can just assume the adversary has access to that. And when you run this through CPSA, you get one shape and it's this right here. And you can see right away that it's not, it's very different from the happy path. Uh, what you're looking at is a man in the middle attack. So there are actually two instances of the protocol running. Um, the client is talking to the uh, adversary, but they think they're actually talking to the proxy. And then you have the proxy talking to the adversary, but you th the proxy thinks they're talking to the client. And so uh, the only reason you know we we have this dotted error right here it just it shows that there was some manipulation of the message and. This is basically the adversary taking the um, the credentials that the client presented to the adversary and using them to sign in at the proxy to establish a session. And then because the client at the end is expecting some kind of privileged information from the proxy, uh, the adversary has to use its session with the proxy to get that uh, um, privileged information, which it then uh, switches over to the other instance of the protocol and then sends to the client so that the client can satisfy all of its steps. So you bypass the certificate check. Oh, that is another, uh, another, uh, okay. So uh, bypassing the certificate check, you, you can see how a man in the middle attack would be feasible. Um, another assumption that we should look into is whether, um, we can successfully establish an SSL TLS channel. And so that channel is the difference between, you know, HTTP and HTTPS. And it is feasible that a client might reach out over HTTP and then the adversary intercepts that call and facilitates the communication with the proxy who's expecting uh, HTTPS. And, and so th that is the attack that we chose to model. Um, and the way we model that is by removing the, um, SSL TLS 
portion, so basically the first stage from the client, uh, and you can see it's gone here, all you're left with is the second and third stages, and then feeding that to um, uh, CPSA and seeing what CPSA outputs, and it gives us this one shape, which is similar to what we saw before. This is yet another man in the middle attack, um, and you see exactly what I was uh, saying. It's facilitating the, um, it's talking with the client, getting their credentials from them that way, and then presenting those to the proxy to get a session going, and then using that session to um, get the privileged information, the response, and then switching over and sends it, sending it to the client. So those are th those last two cases are more flaws with uh, SSL TLS, which is needed for this protocol, but they're not actually flaws for this specific protocol. Case four is a flaw with that with this specific protocol. Um, I think this is the most interesting of the four. Basically, it's what we call the ATL get attack, which is a variation on a cross-site scripting attack. But in a cross-site scripting attack, the adversary is trying to leak the token to themselves. Uh, we said, okay, what if instead of doing that, they instead inject a fully formed you know, request that's just miss, missing the token. And when that code runs in the client's browser, we just attach the token that the client would have received and send that request back to the server. And when you do that, that request now has the right token, the correct token, and is sent on the correct channel. So the proxy will not be able to distinguish that this was sent. This is a malicious request. Um, and because this uh, request will be sent from the client uh, browser, um, any response that would be sent back will be sent to the client. So it doesn't make sense for the adversary to try this, but it can use that request to, um, uh, to send some kind of state changing um, you know, request. So some examples of state changing requests are using that request to change the victim's email address, uh, change the victim's password, mark private files as public. Uh, I, I had Blackboard in mind when I wrote this. So if, if an answer key is uh, marked private and you can hijack a teacher's uh, session, you can just send a request to mark them as public. And now, you know, the entire class has access to the uh, keys, to the answer keys. Uh, you can use it to purchase something, you can use it to transfer funds, make a post, the list goes on. And so we wanted to model this in um, CPSA. And the way we did this is by in injecting another step in the client role where it sends a malicious request. And at this point, the, the, the request will have access to the cookie so we can just attach the cookie and we can send it inside the same encrypted channel that the client and the, and the proxy have been using all along. And um, when we model this and we feed it to CPSA, um, we get a bunch of shapes out, but this is the one that I wanna talk about. Basically, it's it's a lot like Happy Path, but um, the adversary or the network only delivers the malicious request and doesn't deliver the request that the client actually wanted to send. And so if this request had some effect, uh, it, that you know it will be honored by the server and the state that it tried to change will be changed. So those are the four scenarios and the three, the attacks. Um, for those three attacks, I want to present some recommendations for mediating them. Uh, the scenarios where we're bypassing the certificate check, the obvious you know, mitigation is to heed the browser warning unless you know exactly what you're getting into. And the other one is to keep your browser up to date with the latest list of trusted root CAs because as, um, as we find that some root CAs are uh, not following procedures, issuing fraudulent certificates, they get removed from the list of trusted CAs. Um, and then if you stay up to date with that latest list that you can make sure that any malicious uh, CA is removed as soon as, as everybody else finds out that it is that malicious uh, CA. Uh, and so that's, that's for the bypassing the certificate check um, for the uh, scenario where the client reaches out in HTTP and the adversary intercepts. Um, one way to combat this is to use, um, oh yeah, it, to use uh, HTTP strict transfer security, HSTS. Uh, and this basically gets rid of the part where the client is reaching out over HTTP. Because if we can remove that, we can neutralize the attack. Uh, the way this works is uh, when the client and the server establish their first communication, the server tells the um, client's browser to only reach out via HTTPS from now on or for a certain period of time. 
um, even if the client tries to reach out via HTTP by writing HTTP colon slash in the URL bar. Um, this solves it for the most part. There's still the issue where what about the very first uh, attempt that the client um, tries uh, when the client tries to reach uh, the server, there are several proposed solutions to to make sure that we can also protect that very first call. I can get into them after uh, if anyone's interested, but there is a way to mitigate uh, this this flaw in um, uh, the protocol. And then the last one for the tailgate attack, uh, the tailgate attack hinges on being able to inject and execute code in the client's browser. So if you neutralize that, you can neutralize that attack um, and the way you neutralize code injection is proper sanitization and escaping of inputs. Um, so with that, I wanted to go into the discussion. Okay, so something is wrong with, with sorry, with, with my instance of uh, the slides. But I'll, I'll just go quickly into the discussion. So what, what did we get from um, uh, the results? So we see that SPP does neutralize many of the existing avenues of session hijacking. So we see that binding does increase security. Um, and we see also see that a lot of the flaws are um, due to failing to articulate assumptions. So what I mean by that? So they didn't make, they didn't say any assumptions about that we can assume that a secure SSL channel will be established. They make that part of the protocol. And when you make that part of the protocol, that means anything that is um, that that establishment of the SSL channel, anything that can go wrong with that will could go could also happen to our protocol and uh, um, you know compromise the security uh, guarantees that we're counting on. And so that, that's that's how we are able to um, you know talk about case two and case three. It's um, there are weaknesses with the uh, establishment of the SSL TLS channel and um, because we didn't assume that they will always be established, we can, we can uh, go through those scenarios. And then the last, um, uh, last scenario, the tailgating attack, uh, we, you know, they assumed that the adversary will always try to leak the cookie and then try to use the cookie from outside the client's machine. Um, and that assumption is the reason, you know, that attack was missed, but if you use that uh, token and and issue a, a request from inside the client's browser. You can kind of bypass, you know, form a request that will check out. You know, the binding will be done correctly, and it's actually malicious, and it will still be honored by the uh, proxy once it gets there. And so, you know, it, it does highlight the you know importance of making assumptions and how those assumptions affect the uh, guaranteed security properties. Um, and so, that brings me to the last point, which is that. Um, our model has strict assumptions, and so you can always improve the analysis by questioning each of these assumptions. Um, you know, our we, one of the big assumptions we made is that the protocol will happen exactly as the their figure showed. It will have a stage one, stage two, stage three. Uh, it doesn't have to happen like that. Some stages could be repeated, like the third stage where we're sending requests. So uh, a better model would be one where you break down the uh, different stages into different roles and see if you can find interactions between, you know, the different stages running between different instances of the protocol. Um, so that's, you know, that's one big assumption that we made. And there are other uh, assumptions that you can go through and question each one. Um, and you need to make sure that whatever assumption you choose to make for the um, analysis, it can actually hold in real world, because if that's not the case, any security guarantees that you get from the analysis might not hold up in the real world. Um, I'm not sure why this is not showing, uh, but basically in conclusion, uh, uh, assumptions are very important. They're, they're the reason we're able, you know, it's a direct re relationship between what we assume and the security guarantees that we can say after we've analyzed the protocol. Um, and we've shown that, you know, even, even with this tailgate attack, uh, cryptographic binding did increase the security of, uh, the session and it was able to thwart a lot of the existing avenues for um, session hijacking. And with that, I want to thank you and uh, see if anyone has any questions.
Can you share with us some of your experiences using CPSA? Um, uh, how easy did you find it to use? How long did it take you to come up to speed on this tool? Yes. So the way I came up to speed on the tool was by attending Ennis's uh, workshops. Uh, he walks you through all the different, um, you know, start, starting from scratch, what is CPSA, how to use it, how to model very simple uh, protocols, um, and then how that analysis can be helpful in realizing uh, protocol interaction attacks. Um, and one, once you get up to speed, once you go through the workshop, it's really easy to look at, at a well, relatively easy to look at the um, uh, protocol from, you know, the originator's diagram and then transport that into CPSA. Um, some things are tricky, like the, the issue we had with trying to mark something as secret, but allow it to be transported over the network if we so choose. Um, but you can usually find workarounds uh, to guarantee the same, to get the same effect, even if CPSA doesn't have a built-in um, built-in uh, assumption uh, notation that we can use for that. And Carlos, are you aware of any other protocols that try to do this same thing or essentially, you know, wrap some underlying transport mechanism like this? Uh, in terms of like binding um, the session to a channel? Yeah. I think, yes, I think I've seen other tools try to do that. Uh, some of them use client side proxy. Some of them use both client and server side. Um, the idea is I think the same, uh, but yeah, it, to answer your question, I, I've seen other uh, attempts at uh, binding session tokens to channels. Yeah, I'd be interested to see how how other protocols try to do this and if there are best practices in doing it that can, for example, avoid things like I, your recommendations didn't seem super specific to protocol messages or structure, but rather to like the other practices surrounding the protocol. Is that like a reasonable statement? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cause these are, these are fun protocols to analyze and I wonder how many more of this type of protocol are out there. Yeah. And, and after the protocol is analyzed, then you have the issue of implementation because sometimes it doesn't get implemented correctly. So even if you do find a flaw in the uh, design flaw in the protocol, uh, there could be more flaws introduced by just trying to implement that. And I've seen that people trying to implement this very same protocol and, you know, missing the point of where you're supposed to be uh, binding uh, the, it's a cryptographic binding of the token to the channel. So by using the IP address, that's not the same thing as using the, the shared key. Uh, so yeah, even even people that attempt to do this and try to implement it, sometimes the implementations aren't uh, correct and you, you know, open yourself to more security flaws that way. Do the authors make an implementation of this protocol available? Because I've found that's yeah. pretty rare. Yes, they do make an implementation of, I don't know if they make it available, but they do, they do talk about it in their paper. Um, and basically their test is they set up two sessions um, and then copied the cookie from one to the other and showed that copying the cookie across sessions uh, didn't didn't lead to session hijacking. Basically the, the second instance was rerouted to the login page and asked to uh, re-authenticate. Awesome. Do you, do you think it would be feasible to try and implement, for example, the tailgate attack as a proof of concept? I, I think I'm going to try that. Yes, I have not. Um, I've did the research to make sure that it is possible that, uh, you know, a, a request that is formed inside the web page uh, and gets sent out back out to the server will still use the same uh, SSL TLS channel, but I think I should um, get a proof of concept for that. So that, that will be something I'll be working on. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, thank thank you. you. What are your uh, future research and professional plans? Uh, so professional plans, I, I've accepted a full-time position at uh, PayPal. So I'll be starting at the end, very end of May. Um, research plans, I'm hoping to polish this uh, and publish it. Um, and, you know, yeah, yeah. Trying to make this the best that it can be and uh, see if I can get it published.
Are there any other questions? Yeah, actually, are you going to be doing, so uh, you mentioned you're going to be working at PayPal. Are you going to be doing any protocol analysis while you're there? Sadly, no. Um, it's strictly implementation. Well, this will still help you either way. Yeah, yeah. And, and just knowing CPSA is really cool because it, it can be, just having that tool means if I run into protocols in the future where I want to see if there is some, um, you know, weakness in it, having that tool in your tool belt is helpful. So I'm glad to have learned to use that. And I've gotten to apply it to uh, the session binding proxy protocol. Well, thank you very much for an interesting talk. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks um, with more protocol analysis. And hope to see uh, some of you in the hike tomorrow at Harpers Ferry. We'll be posting a, a video of this uh, meeting on the U Cyber page. All right. Thank you. Happy Friday.